Today's episode of the Can Be Now podcast is brought to you by Gustafson Insurance. Business, home, and auto insurance made simple. For a free quote, call 503-266-2216. This tax exemption eludes me like a, a gazelle eludes an arthritic cat. Why can't can be people keep track of their dogs? Like, what is... <laughs> <laughs> to do that, you can't be stupid with guns. Yeah. Is that the board is saying they want to make can be schools great again? <laughs> it feels like we've been doing this interview for years. Just... Inside of me was screaming. <laughs> <laughs> you run for school board, you win or you die. <laughs> There's no second place. <laughs> Welcome to the Can Be Now podcast. We are the best and easiest way to stay connected to what's happening in your hometown. I'm Tyler Frankie. I'm Joy Sturby. And I'm Tyler Clausen. It's official. Canby's new city administrator will be Scott McClure, current administrator of the city of Monmouth in Polk County. McClure will replace current Canby city administrator Rick Robinson who's been in the position since 2014, but retires at the end of October. McClure's appointment was announced in July, but just became official after the city council approved his contract in a meeting earlier this month. McClure will start in his new position October 7th, so we will have a few weeks overlap before Robinson passes the torch. His annual base salary will be $15,000, along with health, life and disability insurance, retirement benefits through PERS, and other fringe benefits. He will also receive the use of a car for city-related business and a cell phone stipend of $75 a month. Raises will be considered annually based on merit, budget situation, a satisfactory performance evaluation, and approval by the City Council. Should McClure be fired without cause, the city's contract allows for him to receive six months salary and six months of health insurance. If he's terminated for cause or resigns voluntarily, he will not be entitled to severance. McClure has served as Monmouth City Administrator since 2007. Prior to that, he had held the position of City Manager for Coos Bay and Brush, Colorado. He was an analyst for the city of Gladstone from 1989 to 1996. He holds a master's of public administration and a bachelor's in political science, both from Portland State University. So what is a city administrator anyway? It's actually a pretty important job. Though the mayor and city council are the elected officials who enact ordinances, make policy decisions, and set overall agendas for the city, the city administrator really runs things in the day-to-day. Functioning much like the CEO of a corporation, the city administrator also oversees the background work and makes recommendations on most of the decisions that come before city council. The city administrator also handles personnel. This is one of only three jobs that are appointed by and report directly to the council, the other two being city judge and city attorney. The city administrator heads up all hiring, firing, promotions, and disciplinary actions that may otherwise be required for people who work for the city of Canby. The city charter actually prohibits counselors from giving orders or direction to employees. It all has to go through the administrator. This is particularly important as the city is facing a number of retirements and other vacancies in critical departments in the coming year. The new city administrator will be largely in charge of filling these positions. McClure could thereby play a large role in helping shape the composition of the city's police, planning, and other vital departments for the years to come. A woman whom police believe to have been under the influence of alcohol survived driving off a steep cliff in Eagle Creek late Monday night. She sustained only minor injuries. Clackamas County Sheriff's Office deputies were dispatched to the Eagle Creek area Monday on information from a brief 911 call that came in at approximately 11.12 p.m. The caller, later identified as Kristen Ann Maiden, Madden? We'll go with Madden, had said that she was in a ravine 
needed help and didn't know where she was, but she eventually told dispatch that she had just left the Eagle Creek Saloon, according to the sheriff's office. Dispatch was able to trace the call to a general location, and deputies located the victim by following tire tracks that led off the roadway. Her silver Nissan Xterra was at the bottom of a steep ravine and badly damaged. A CCSO spokesman later estimated the distance down the ravine to be at least 40 feet. As the gate of fire, American Medical Response and Clackamas Fire District personnel responded to the scene, Life Flight was placed on standby. Rescuers determined that they would need to conduct a technical rope rescue to reach the vehicle and extract Madden. Rescuers found that she was, incredibly enough, able to walk and appeared to have suffered only minor injuries. Life flight was canceled and the rescue personnel helped Madden reach the top of the cliff. Madden was transported to an area hospital for treatment. While at the hospital, Madden told police that she drove off the roadway due to a squirrel, uh, which I, I really hope that that squirrel was appreciative of such a sacrifice. She was issued a citation for driving under the influence of intoxicants. Christine Drazen is the state representative from Canby in her first term serving in the Oregon legislature. Drazen has been chosen to lead the House Republicans caucus next year. She will succeed Representative Carl Wilson of Grants Pass. In a statement, Drazen shared, It is an honor and a privilege to be selected by my colleagues to lead our caucus into 2020. We appreciate the service of Representative Wilson, as our leader during one of the most challenging periods in Oregon legislative history. We cannot thank him enough for his dedicated years of service to our caucus and the residents of Oregon. Representative Drazen said that House Republicans will prioritize making a positive difference in the lives of all Oregonians. Hardworking Oregonians must always be our priority, she said. We are committed to supporting and serving the interests of families and communities while making Oregon more affordable. Elected in 2018, Christine Drazen represents House District 39, which includes Canby, Estacada, Boring, and rural Clackamas County. Representative Drazen's interim committee assignments include Economic Development, Healthcare, Joint Ways and Means Committee, Ways and Means Subcommittee on Education, and the emergency board. Drazen currently serves as a legislative representative to the Oregon Innovation Council and the Willamette Falls Locks Commission. She also serves as co-chair with Democratic Representative Jeff Reardon of the newly formed bipartisan Clackamas Caucus. Representative Drazen is a fourth generation Oregonian serving her first term in the Oregon legislature. She is a member of the Clackamas County Planning Commission and a proud graduate of George Fox University. She and her husband, Dan, live in rural Clackamas County between Canby and Oregon City with their three children. For our recent in-depth interview with Representative Drazen, check out our next episode of the Canby Now podcast. We'll be discussing her first term as an elective representative in the legislature, and to talk about her thoughts on the Republican walkout in the Senate. All right, police beat for the week of August 13th through the 18th. At 10.42 p.m. on the 13th, an uninsured vehicle being driven by an, a suspended driver was towed, and the driver was provided with a courtesy ride to his nearby destination. So that was nice I guess. August 14th at 11.14 p.m., a man was arrested for an outstanding Clackamas County Circuit Court warrant. That's that it. He was just arrested. 11.45 p.m., after a witness reported a possible intoxicated driver, an officer located the vehicle as it swerved its lane of travel and nearly struck the sidewalk. The driver was arrested for DUI alcohol. On August 15th at 12.41 a.m., two transient individuals trespassing on private property were detained. One of the individuals who became combative was arrested for disorderly conduct and criminal trespass. The other was cited and released. Seems like a pretty good moral to a story. 
At 9.30 p.m., an officer witnessed a vehicle traveling at a high rate of speed and then make an unlawful turn into a driveway of a closed business. The driver and passenger both quickly exited their vehicle and the driver fled on foot. The passenger was detained and released. The driver was arrested on an outstanding warrant. August 16th at 8.14 a.m., report of a theft of lawn equipment from a business. And that's it. That seems pretty petty, but all right. 9.02 p.m., report of a victim attempting to purchase a dog online from a person posing as a breeder. 10.20 p.m., following a traffic stop, the the driver was arrested for DUI alcohol. At 12.14 a.m., the occupants of a vehicle parked in a church parking lot were contacted, and the driver was cited for MIP. I almost said MIP, like men in black but no this is minor in possession of marijuana so worse maybe not worse than mib3 but worse than the first one for sure 10 5 p.m an uninsured vehicle was impounded following a traffic stop the driver was cited for having an open container of alcohol speeding and driving uninsured 10 10 p.m a traffic stop was conducted after a vehicle failed to stop at a red light the driver was arrested for dui alcohol Seems like a lot of alcohol going on these days, guys. What's going on? You guys know that it is illegal, right? Like, do you guys know the law? <laughs> I don't know. 12.40 a.m., a vehicle was stopped for failing to obey a traffic control device and swerving across the yellow and white lines bor- bordering its lane of travel. The driver was arrested for DUI. Yeah, I think, uh, I think that the DUI alcohol is taking place in the methamphetamines that I normally complain about. But... I, I guess I, I won't ever stop complaining about people breaking the law. 2.06 a.m., a vehicle failing to maintain its lane of travel was stopped. The driver was arrested for DUI. 9.54 a.m., a man was arrested outside a grocery store on an outstanding Clackamas County warrant. 9.57 p.m., officers saw a person known to have an outstanding Clackamas County warrant for a theft exit a store. The man was taken into custody on the warrant and trespassed from the store. At the time of arrest, he is also found in possession of stolen items. At midnight, well, not midnight, at noon, I should should get my times right. At noon, report of a theft from a farm store. And that's it. Just someone stole from a farm store. And finally, at 2.28 p.m., an uninsured vehicle being driven by a suspended driver was stopped. The driver was sighted, and the vehicle was towed. And now an update on visioning in downtown Canby. After several months of studying our downtown and talking with Canby residents and business owners, Michelle Reeves of Civilis Consultants will return next week to share her report and recommendations. The presentation will focus on how to improve economic performance in downtown Canby. Michelle Reeves is an economic strategist with significant experience revitalizing districts. She is the founder and principal of Civilis Consultants with more than 18 years in experience in downtown districts all over the country and a strong private sector background in commercial real estate. She was contracted by Canby's Economic Development Office in May. Her role involved hosting a civic identity workshop for local business owners, which happened last month, conducting a community survey, and delivering an overall framework for downtown development. In her presentation next week, she will share how Canby collectively defined its story and what residents identified as the experience they would like downtown to offer in the future. She will be breaking down components of Canby's civic identity. This will also include ideas for metamorphosis in the form of toolkits for property owners, business owners, the public sector, and nonprofit agencies. Reeves has a particular passion for helping small and independent business owners succeed. She will demonstrate many local opportunities for improving sales, with a particular focus on ideas that are easy to implement right away and at a low cost. The presentation will take place next Wednesday, September 25th at 6 p.m. in the Antonia Ballroom, right above the Backstop Bar and Grill. But if you want a sneak peek, we've got you covered. Just stay tuned to this podcast. We'll have Michelle on right after the break. 
So I'm here with Derek Hill, president of Advantage Mortgage in Canby. I was wondering what's going on in the mortgage industry right now. The mortgage industry is on fire right now. The big thing that's really exciting for us is that we are now an independent mortgage broker, which means that we can offer substantially lower rates and lower fees for our customers. For example, we just got a loan last week and the realtor said, hey, I think you should go talk to Derek at Advantage Mortgage. And sure enough, we got the borrower three quarters better rate and we saved them 14 grand in fees. Cool. So where, where can people find you? So office number is 503-266-5800 or they can find us on the web at findtheadvantage.com. But most people just give us a holler or they stop in. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Derek. Yeah, bet. Advantage Mortgage, NMLS number 1770599. Derek Hills, NMLS number 50183. Equal housing opportunity. I am not a golfer. I mean, I'm not a good golfer. So when I want to play a few rounds, I head over to Frontier Golf Course. They're family-owned, family-friendly, nine-hole course with beautiful scenery. And they let me rent clubs or bring my own. And they don't judge me for my slices and hacks. Or, you know, my language. Frontier Golf Course is a great place to meet your buddies and have a drink or bring your kids along. They're located on Holly Street just north of town. If you hit the ferry, you've gone too far. Also, please don't hit the ferry. (laughs) Yeah, please don't. But do ask them about Farley the Goat. They love that. Frontier prides itself on being the best value course you'll find in the area. If you haven't been by in a while, you've got to come check out what the new owners have done. Frontier Golf Course. It's a new frontier. Welcome back, listeners. I'm here at Gwen's Coffee House in downtown Canby, and I'd like to introduce you to Michelle Reeves. She's the principal of, you say it, Civilis? Yeah, that's well, that's how I say it. I don't okay. know if that's the proper Latin way of that's saying it. That's how I'm going to say it, too. <laughs> Civilis Consultants. And Michelle, why don't you um, say hi? Hello. <laughs> and welcome to the show. And just tell the listeners a little bit about uh, what you're doing for the city of Canby. Uh, well, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. I am working with the city of Canby on a project around creating both a downtown framework for economic development into the future, as well as a particular focus on things that businesses can be doing right now for not huge amounts of money to move the dial on sales per square foot. So we're really going to be diving into the business owner toolkit and what you guys can be doing to generate more economic activity downtown. That's awesome. And I think that the study that you're doing was grant funded, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? I'm actually not sure. Okay, yeah. cool. Well, we'll have to ask the city about that. But, um, so you were telling me before we turned on the recorder a little bit about kind of your process and how you uh, come up with the information that you ultimately use to make these recommendations and make your study. It sounded very much like uh, just kind of stalking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there, there is a little element of that. Usually when I'm doing this work, I do get people will poke out of offices yeah, like, or will like, like wax off my clipboard. Okay, that woman has and, walked by yeah. here four times. Like, <laughs> my what is Camera <laughs> and yeah, and I'm taking pictures of very weird things. I took a lot of pictures of you know the water tower, okay. um, so things like that. Um, uh, so what I'm doing, well, so broadly, we're in order to do that sort of strategic look at downtown. I'm going to do a mix of things. We're going to have a big workshop this Thursday. Um, we're going to have a, a community survey, and then I do a lot of on the ground work, just trying to to get a sense of how downtown is operating and what's on offer and how all of that stuff is is interacting with each other. So today, the work that I was doing is along those lines. So I was trying to, as I told you earlier, daylight my subconscious. Yeah. And so that is trying to walk through a place and drive through a place and understand all of the things that I'm feeling and why I'm feeling them. Yeah. So one of the biggest challenges about market research, if you just ask people, well, how do you feel about downtown Canby? It's really hard to answer that question because we don't actually know why we feel the way we do. Right. And it's even hard to put words to uh, how we feel when we're in a commercial district and why we might like it or not like it. And yeah. so what I'm trying to do... Especially when it's abstract. Like if yes. you are there in downtown Canby, you can maybe answer that question. Like, how do you feel right now? At the now? moment, yeah. But if you're trying right. to think... 
being in your separated from it in some way. Yeah, you don't know, normally have these strong associations necessarily. Right. Um, what are areas you like, and yeah. what do you not like, and why? And right. those are things that we don't really know the answers to. And if I just visit a place and I'm not working, I don't look at those things necessarily either. I just sort of have those emotional reactions and move on. Right. So my job when I'm working in a community is to walk through and say, okay, um, why am I having those feelings, or what am I particularly drawn to, or what really makes me want to stay here or not stay here. Um, sometimes I take more pictures of the places I don't want to stay because yeah. I want to go back and really understand what is it about that place that is making me feel like I don't want to be there. So um, today is, is really uh, a day of just doing that kind of, of canvassing work and, and daylighting my subconscious. So I do a mix of driving and walking, and I do a mix of marking things on a map. I'm trying to understand broadly in the map what kinds of uses are in a place. So yes. are they medical uses? Are they residential uses? Are they park or civic uses? Or are they uses around commerce? So I'm trying to understand what the different zones of, of downtown are. Like you you have a lot of dentists in downtown. Do. So I, I would say Cammy's very dedicated to uh, oral health. <laughs> yes. So, um, and so, you know, some of that is just honoring those zones. You might have a medical zone. So how do we help that be the best medical zone that it can be, for right. instance? Right. So well, I... So, so, <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe not. So um, uh, I, I don't think sales would be really good because you feel really guilty when you come out of the dentist and you yeah, don't, yeah, you don't want to eat you know some sticky gooey taffy that's gonna sit there. I mean, if you maybe if you don't like your dentist though, you want to go stick it to him and just like right. walk right next door and eat the biggest Reese's cup you can find. Possible, <laughs> but uh, I don't know that we're gonna put you in charge of ten okay, next you know what? downtown. I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna do a proposal, submit it to you. You have a lot. Of it. See if you want to include it in your report. That's totally up to you. I won't be offended. So, um, uh, so like I talked about before, when you're wandering around a town like this, I do a mix of documenting on maps, looking around and kind of seeing how I feel and what I think, and then I take boatloads of photographs. And part of the reason that I do that is I will note on a map, for instance, how I feel about a place or a mix of uses that are there. And sometimes I can't put my finger on why I might feel the way I do about that place. And so that's where going back and really looking at photographs helps me to understand what I'm seeing or maybe reacting to. Maybe it's a district that has a lot of buildings that are not built right next to each other. And so I'm just looking at lots of blank walls that are the sides of buildings or the backs of buildings, which is not super inviting and doesn't make me as a woman feel safe if it's 4.30 and dark in the winter, for instance. So those are the kinds of things I sometimes understand more when I'm looking back at photographs than I do when I'm there in the moment. And I, I told the story about Astoria, which is an amazing community, population of 10,000. They are the poster child for being able to get stuff done on a, on a really limited budget, really fantastic downtown association, and, and a ton of history. And as I was working there on a six-month project, I had this sort of nagging feeling that there was more decay. It felt more decayed in some places than I felt like the built-in environment warranted me feeling and I just yeah. couldn't put my finger on it. So I just sat down and I went through every photograph I'd taken in Astoria over a six month period and I take a lot of photographs and I finally put my finger on it which was the fact that it's an elevated city that is built above the floodplain so the fishing boats could come into the canneries and so when they lose a building it's not it doesn't just become a flat lot parking lot it becomes a hole in the environment because the basement is actually below grade and so you have these places that are surrounded by chain link fence and are kind of these holes in the earth which gives a little bit of a feeling of like did a bomb go off I mean what happened here because we don't have a lot of cities that are elevated in that way where if you lose a building you, you end up with kind of a hole in the ground yeah. and and so in some ways you're walking around downtown and you don't see those because they're below your visual level but you feel them so that's kind of the odd thing your eye just sort of skips over them but they contribute to this feeling when you're downtown so that would be an example of it was something I couldn't put my finger on until after I had um, kind of looked at all the photographs and yeah. then it just went ding, okay. I don't see that in very many places. Yeah. Holes in the ground everywhere. Right. Yeah. Cool. Right. It's so cool. I love how immersive your process is. Like I think sometimes people think when they hear like, oh, you know, the city hired a consultant. It's some like, you know, office drone. It's right. Like, you know, <laughs> preparing some report, like maybe visited here once for 10 minutes or whatnot and then tells us, you know, how can be what Cammy needs to do. So I love that you're really digging in and taking all these photos and like, you know, 
like stalking downtown. I, I am. Said. Yeah. Um, so I love downtown Gamby. I love being here. Just, I do a lot of interviews here at Gwen's. Um, I just love the, the energy and the things that are happening. That said, I think this is fair to say that downtown Canby is a little bit um, schizophrenic, you know, we're kind of in process right now, I feel. And I wonder how that affects uh, your process as far as c coming in here and kind of trying to figure out what what assets we have, where we're going, where we need to go, because um, we're already in different areas, you know, different projects. We have different leaders that you know go different directions. So over time, we haven't had a really consistent um, revitalization effort yet. We're in the midst of it. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got the Dahlia, which is brand new, practically, you know, and largely unoccupied at this point. You know, that that's happening. Um, but we're, we're very much in flux, and how does that affect, you know, your, is that good to, to not have necessarily like a really finished product and, and to have you maybe come and kind of see this is where it makes sense for you to continue growing? Or So I would say that every stage district can look to how they're going to improve. Yeah. It's just you're bringing different tools to the table depending on what stage it's in. Sure. So Canby has so many things going for it. So one of the, the first key things is that is it, it's slightly outside of the Portland, Vancouver, you know, Hillsboro MSA. So it's, it's its own individual unit that is separate from that, but still close enough to benefit from yeah. it. But it really allows you to build your own identity yeah. and, and that's really clear here. Yeah. Secondly, you have a fantastic little grid and wonderful housing immediately surrounding your downtown commercial area. Okay. There are a million small downtowns I work in where that is not true. Yeah. So you have everything that you have a population right around downtown. You have a great collection of buildings right around downtown. You have all the services that you could want in your downtown. So there is this complete unit of civic life that already exists here. And a lot of communities your size do not have that. Yeah. So yeah. huge, huge benefit. Um, I would say, so the way that I break it down is I look at sort of the, it's all economics. I don't talk about, because there are different political ways of looking at things. There are different ways of bringing tools to the table that come from the political sphere, and I don't really get involved in that conversation. Yeah. I really just look at how do the economics of downtown work, mm -hmm. and what can we do to foster, so we got to all learn about those and what that vocabulary is and how downtown economics work. And then you have to look at toolkits for the big three, and the big three that control how a downtown does economically are property owners and they're probably your most important because they control how buildings look and what businesses go into those buildings which is kind of game set and match when it comes to how a downtown is doing. Business owners are super important because what's happening on the ground floor of a district establishes the brand and identity of that district. So if my business owners aren't executing on this whole host of sort of baseline ground floor experience things then that's going to have an impact on how downtown does. And then the last group are what I call sort of public sector slash agencies. So it might be a chamber, it might be uh, a nonprofit that does economic development, it's yeah. the city, it's the county, it's all of these things. Um, so they are sort of the last group that has a really big impact on the, the public environment. And you guys also have a public sphere and an agency sphere that has resources that they're bringing to the table. Um, so you guys are kind of, I would say Canby is at my sort of favorite stage which is small investments and improvements can really move, move the dial and have this multiplier effect because yeah. you've got you know the city's on board and they have resources you have a great collection of buildings you have the grid you've got so it's, it's all the pieces are kind of here we just got to get everyone to execute on their toolkit and kind of be working in concert toward those economic goals which is what I'm going to be talking about yeah yeah and I feel like um, at least from my experience we, we have a business community you know, in Greater Canby, but in uh, downtown Canby as well, is really wanting to be engaged in that process. They're very open to, um, you know, how can they do what they're specifically doing better, and also how can they reach out and partner. Um, we've gotten, I mean, just in our crazy little thing that we do with the podcast, like we've gotten so much support from the chamber and from the business community, um, you know, shockingly so, in my opinion. So um, I think that that's really cool, and that obviously fits into where we need to go as a downtown. Michelle, I uh, 
I originally wanted to talk to you because I follow you on Twitter and you were kind of sharing some of your thoughts. You were, I think you were sharing some photos, the photographer over here, from downtown Kimmy. Just some of the things that you, you really loved, you know, some things are really sticking out to you about downtown Kimmy. I don't want you to give away your report or anything like that, but can you give us a little sneak peek about maybe some of the assets or some of the things that specifically that you think are really unique, really great about downtown Canby, um, and maybe for some listeners, it, it might be news to them that maybe haven't come down that in a while. Well, I mean, one of the first things is, so I work all around the country, and I actually show pictures of Canby's streetscape and public sphere improvements to smaller towns all over the country, because the road really matters, your sidewalks really matter, your your planter baskets, your, you guys have that dialed in, and for a community your size, there aren't a lot of communities that have created such a beautiful public sphere. I'm glad you started with that, because when you were talking earlier about the things that you don't really see, you just kind of absorb. I feel like that's huge in downtown Canby. Like I was talking to Calvin Lesser about this one time, uh, the city's economic development and tourism coordinator. I think I got his title right. But um, just the, the planters, you know, you don't really notice them, but I feel like if they weren't here, you'd be like, what the heck right. happened to downtown Canby? Like something's different. You know, it's such a huge part of the experience, especially this season, you know, mm -hmm. the, the spring, summer season. But um, you, you don't necessarily notice it. You know, especially like me, I don't like, oh, that's a peony or whatever. I don't even know what kind of flower it is, you know. But it just, it really adds to feeling good about where you are, I mm -hmm. think. So. so, a small downtown is like a single store. Mm -hmm. And your buildings are your fixtures, and your products are your businesses. Mm -hmm. And so, if you think about downtown as a store, then your roads and your sidewalks are your aisles. And what's on those aisles and how they look and what you're doing with them are just as important in your downtown store and the exterior as they would be on the interior of the store. And the nicer they look, the more people are going to want to walk. The more people are willing to park further away from their business and walk, which is actually good for downtown commerce. And it makes you, it, it's part of the, um, you, you notice when I was talking at the beginning, I talked about mood a lot and yeah. trying to indicate how I feel. Yeah, I, I just, I don't want to interrupt, but I just yeah. love that metaphor because you, you think of like you walking down an aisle and you see a shelf that's empty, right? you know, and it's like that for an empty storefront. Right. It just jars you. It feels terrible. It, yeah. Yeah, same yeah. thing. So, so all of these things are part of the fixturing of your store. But I, I really love that uh, when you walk around down at that mood. So, so when you do in-store assessments, one of the big things that we're doing when we're tracking customers is we're tracking mood. So customer behavior. What are they touching? What are they smiling at? Where are their pain points? Where are they really unhappy? Because all of those things impact sales. So the same thing is true in your downtown store. So I really want to understand when I'm going through downtown what is setting the mood and is it a good mood or is it a bad mood like is there a terrible intersection in the middle of your town that stresses me out and makes me never want to go there and avoid it because if that's true that's a pain point and we have to figure out how we're tackling it so one of the reasons that I mentioned that sort of public streetscape is it's setting a fantastic mood just being in downtown which makes me happy to be in your downtown store which is huge and sometimes or often I work in downtowns where I have to I'm working from okay it's terrible to be in the downtown store yeah. <laughs> so big big advantage so I love that and the light posts and all of that banners really really well done so I, I think that's fantastic I think the second thing that you guys some of this is just these are the the things that you don't realize that are here but the block grid structure and the size of the blocks and the small lot development and the mix of buildings all of those things are, are really really fantastic so um, I can create a successful commercial node out of of any kind of building stock if I've got a mix of buildings built right up to the sidewalk right next to each other I can create a node of activity maybe it's a destination node because there is not really anyone living around there or maybe it's one that draws from the local area but you can create that if you just have that infrastructure sometimes I work in small downtowns that have very little of that infrastructure it's very toothy it's like one building big parking lot one building big parking lot that's much harder so you have a good core of those things the next thing that you guys have are some essential amenities that most towns your size don't have. So the movie theater, yeah. which is partly because of your grocery store, which is the other thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so the family that owns your grocery store, you know, that civic, native sons and daughters are often the people who invest the most in the built environment yeah. in ways that really benefit a small downtown. And they're a great example of that. So having a grocery store immediately downtown, having a movie theater immediately downtown, having a sexy new library immediately.
immediately downtown. All of those things are really great building blocks to, to work outward from. Did you just call our library sexy? Yeah, well, yeah, it was sexy new library. It's exciting. And it is exciting. I mean, a library libraries have become such a center of civic life. Yeah. Like you said, you do interviews in the library. Like so many interesting things happen at the library now. It's not just about getting a book or not getting a book. It's it really they've become these central hubs of community. There's a lot. Of, they, there's a lot of concerts, a lot of cultural and educational stuff. So, you know, for kids or for the community that happens through our library. It really is a big cultural center for Canby. Um, and you know, people talk sometimes. They're like, "Can we need the cultural center?" We need to like, the library is that for right? Us. It really is. Yeah. Um, what about our events? That's a, I feel, a big part of downtown Canby. Is that something that you look at? Very it much is. In your I do. Process? So we're going to be using, uh, and we haven't even talked about this yet. So the process that I use to create a framework for a community in which to talk about the economic stuff actually is going to go back to sort of this daylighting subconscious and mood. So I use the improv improvisation framework that improvisers use to create compelling stories and we use story to quantify a district in a community's own work. So you like go up to downtown business owners and you're like, give me a movie. So <laughs> no, what I'm gonna do favorite is, actor is, from the eighties. <laughs> it's gonna be and similar the name of a job <laughs> that you can do from home. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be even deeper than that. Okay. They're, they're going to really learn the actual framework, and they're going to have to apply it. And um, and then we're going to apply that to Canby. So we're going to talk about how you apply story-based branding to places, and then I'm going to break everyone up into groups, and I'm going to ask them questions from the story framework. So the four elements of the story framework are characterization, objective, relationship, and environment or context. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to um, talk about those four things. A lot of what we've been talking about here is the physical story, which yeah. is characterization. And it's really important for a place because your physical story is on 24-7. Yeah. Your building just doesn't disappear when yeah. you turn the lights off and go away. Yeah. So when I drive through town at night to go to a movie, yeah. I am getting an impression of downtown Canby. Yeah. And maybe it's not such a great impression. That it's close, yes. I would say. Right. Yeah. And, right and so Because we're so service-oriented. Right. Yeah. And it's not yeah. doing jobs. So everyone has to do a, do, do a good job 24-7 yeah. with that physical story. Um, the rest of the story framework is getting again at these moods and feelings and what's going on and, and what is sort of the heart of your story. And objective is what motivates you and what people should experience when they're downtown. And relationship is what do people relate to and what do they not relate to and who is relating and not relating to downtown. And then environment is your context and how do you leverage your context. So back to your question about events, that's a big thing that we look at is what do people relate to currently in downtown and then how do we leverage that more effectively. So I would say that your events are very effective and people are really relating to your events, but I don't know that that is resulting in a commerce bump downtown, which is actually not uncommon because people will sometimes come in. Um, I'll give you an example from uh, a, a business <clears throat> that's florist and homewares in Lake Oswego, and they were in a location in downtown Lake Oswego, and Farmer's Market Day was their slowest day, which is a hugely popular event in downtown Lake Oswego. And so he moved to a new location, and some of the key to driving commerce on event days is you have to figure out how to meet the customer in the mood that they're in for that event. Mm -hmm. And on Farmer's Market Days, we're all about being outside, and we're all about cash and carry. So I'm not going to go buy a set of bunk beds on Farmer's Market Day. Oh, yeah. So you have to figure out how you introduce your business and what you do to them and you have to meet them where they are emotionally. So this business took some of their parking lot and created a mini farmer's market area out front that met people in the mood that they were in for the farmer's market for that huge event day. And it went from being a day that they closed early to one of their most successful sales days of the week. So part of having events, you can actually hold a lot of successful events from in your downtown, but not necessarily get a lot of commercial activity activity from those events or even positive brand association. It's sort of like it happens in a vacuum. So so I've worked in many downtowns that have super popular events, but people still don't go downtown for anything. Yeah. So it's an odd disconnect. So those are I'm definitely gonna be looking at that. It's a strength that people love to come into downtown yeah. for events, but I've definitely, you know, heard some there's not necessarily a commercial bump that comes yeah. from that. That's interesting. And, and that'll be really interesting to see what your thoughts are as far as how we can help funnel more of that because 
you, you know, like Independence Day, we got like 10,000 right. people down here. Yeah. It's like more than half the population of Canby just in this little grid. Um, but uh, yeah, it would be interesting to see how we can kind of strengthen that that interactivity for, for our downtown businesses. My last question I wanted to ask you, Michelle, and this is something that you're kind of known for advocating, as far as I understand, is that the, the really the most important thing about a strong downtown is having like a, a really strong, active podcast and podcast studio. I believe is something you always advocate. Number one recommendation. Yeah, I mean, yes. that's that's what I've heard. Yeah. No, uh, honestly. Um, Kind of the, the creative aspect of things. How does that play into um, having a strong downtown? Because I think that that's something that we do have to a certain extent here, but could definitely um, expand as far as having outdoor concerts and things. We have, we have a few of them. We have the Slice of Summer uh, series that happens in Wake Park. I know the, the Dahlia Building has an idea, uh, or the Dahlia Block, I should say, of having an outdoor uh, space eventually where there might be some cultural things or some music. Um, but, I mean, our studio, I was joking, but we, we do have a dream of, of having a downtown studio that, that's sort of a hub for creativity and storytelling for our community. Um, how does that interplay into uh, a strong downtown, or how have you maybe seen that um, lived out? So, I think it's hugely important. Yeah. So, <clears throat> excuse my voice again. Um, I would say that the way you want to think about downtown is it should be kind of a distillation of everything that can be is. Yeah. So it should, it should really reflect everything that you are, everything that's special about you, everything that's interesting about you. And every community has a really interesting collection of people doing creative things. Mm-hmm. And I want downtown to always be an expression of that, no matter what it is. So that's, that's you really could cool. be in downtown Spokane, and you could have space that is an expression of all of the creative things that um, some of the Native American tribes are doing around Salish immersion and publishing music and books in Salish and, and those kinds of things. It can yeah. be it can be literally anything. It doesn't have to just be the traditional paintings or galleries or concert. Yeah. I really want people to think about how are they taking this distributed talent. Downtown Madras has some of the most amazing woodworkers who have space both in the gallery and their, their standalone uh, studio space in downtown. Those are incredible things to reflect. Having talent around broadcasting. How do you, maybe you have an outdoor story slam in the park. Maybe, you, you know, story is a central part of your creativity. Downtown Colfax, California has a bunch of false second story storefronts over their kind of old west canopy on their main street and a couple of artists, their artist community got together and painted a couple of really cool murals on the building and that completely transformed how those buildings felt and so there are a million ways in which your creative community has a really big impact on how we feel about being in the downtown both through how they help express that in buildings, like I always tell small communities that they should be creating almost a downtown and stream makeover team that mm-hmm. combines creative talent in the community to talk about color, to talk about windows for service office, to think about how to express things that are uniquely can be in yes. the, the built environment and move the dial on economics and also be sort of an expression of that. And then I also want to see space dedicated to those things as well. Yeah, absolutely important. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Michelle. This has been so great to, to hear from you. Thank you for your time um, talking to us, but also that you're investing in our community and helping guide us along our path to being a big grown-up downtown. Uh, yeah. Uh, is there anything that you'd like to add uh, before you go or anything that you want people to know about? Well, just don't be alarmed if you see a, a lady walking around <laughs> taking photos of strange things with a clipboard. It's right. just me. Right. If it's a dude, <laughs> call That's right. Place, so. All right. Thank you, Michelle. We're going to take a quick break, guys. Stay tuned. You know, Halloween will be here before you know it. Heck, the decorations are already in the stores. So I've got a scary good deal for you. DirectLink is offering 50% off their blazing fast internet speeds now through All Hallows Eve. Not only will you get a sweet candy corn of a deal, but every one of their broadband connections comes with unlimited data. Free. And that's no trick. So switch to DirectLink to stream and surf as much as you like. Plus, take advantage of free Wi-Fi home networking for six months with free installation of commercial-grade Wi-Fi equipment that ensures your entire home has the strongest, most consistent signal in every room. Talk about a treat. Call 503-266-8111 or visit directlink.coop for blazing fast internet. 
true story. When we first started the Canby Now podcast, we were looking to buy some stickers, just something to help us get our name out there. We didn't have a lot of money, so we tried to do everything as cheaply as possible online. We wound up with a thousand of these teeny tiny cheap looking stickers. Not exactly the impressive swag we were hoping for, but you know, you get what you pay for. Yes, you do. If we had been smart, we would have gone to see Carrie at Promotional Strategies. She's a real life human and a creative <laughs> genius who would deliver practical, strategic ways to promote your business on any budget. If you're looking for high quality swag that you can be proud to see your logo on, Promotional Strategies is where you want to go. Find them at 695 Southeast First Avenue in Canby or online at ps266swag.com. All right. Well, coming up this Saturday is going to be the second uh, in what's becoming an annual thing. Uh, It's going to be the historic marker cleaning happening at Zion Memorial Cemetery here in Canby on Township Road. And joining us on the line now is Judy Jarosh. She's a member of the Canby Heritage and Landmark Commission and the organizer of this year's cleaning. Hi, Judy. Hi, Tyler. Hi, how are you? I'm very good, thank you. Thank you for having me on today. Absolutely. We're delighted to have you. Tell us a little bit about the cleaning. So this is, uh, like we said, the second year that the commission has done the event, uh, your first year organizing it. Tell us a little bit about kind of what happens um, for folks that weren't able to take part last year. Right. Well, thank you. So uh, as part of the uh, Heritage and Landmark Commission, we partner with the Oregon Commission on Historic Cemeteries, and we have some small grant monies provided to us so that we can um, take care of our wonderful historic cemeteries Mm -hmm. and make sure that, you know, that the markers are preserved and that their life is prolonged and so people can read their artwork and their inscriptions. Um, so this is the second year at Zion. It's been done previously at Baker Prairie uh, Historic Cemetery, but uh, there's much to do at Zion Memorial. Yeah, Zion is obviously much larger, and um, uh, I mean, it, it, obviously because it, it's still active and still growing, as it were. But um, in, in terms of the number of historic markers and and number of sites that are in need of repair our attention is probably quite a bit larger as well is that right it is larger and um, i'm glad you asked but we don't quite know the exact number the database is a little incomplete which is no fault of the city of canby they inherited they were given the cemetery in 1937 and inherited a database that was incomplete at the time mm. and i have the database one of my goals is to get it updated so it, it lacks um, a lot of dates of the old historic markers so i can't tell you but i would guess there are several hundred markers that are 100 years old or more Mm -hmm. we aim to do 75 markers a year there are actually 1700 markers in the historic section but uh, i would say the majority of them are not 100 years old but many 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 are Mm -hmm. did you say 1700 Yes, in the his, in what's called the historic section of the of the Zion Memorial Park, it's unbelievable. That is, that's incredible. And the, <laughs> r, r, do you know the year? I I know I drove by the sign the other day. Uh, you know when when the, the cemetery was established, and I was just flabbergasted. It was like what, like eighteen fifty or something? It was crazy. Eight. Hey. Yeah, 1897. Oh, okay. Well, uh, maybe I exaggerate a little bit, but still, that's <laughs> okay. uh, just four years younger than the city of Canby itself. That's right. <laughs> um, cool. Well, and it's not necessarily typical for a for a city or for a local government to own a cemetery. Like you said, they sort of fell into it. But that's right, and they do a wonderful job. I, you know, if you've ever been there, it really is a beautiful site, and the city does a, an amazing job of um, maintaining it. It's very pretty, peaceful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It is a beautiful site. So I understand that one. One thing that um, sort of requires the the need for this type of uh, event, you know, for the, you know, the heritage or at least folks who understand history to be involved, obviously volunteer labor is needed, but there's a certain way for historical markers um, to maintain their history and their integrity. There's certain, uh, like as I understand, certain certain chemicals, certain processes that need to be uh, followed and used. Is that right, Judy? That is right, and um, this organization uses 
um, products that are uh, they're uh, very environmentally friendly, something called D2, and people receive very specific training on how to scrape the markers and clean the markers without doing you know any harm. And so it's one reason that we have it available as a, a volunteer activity, mostly for adults and for some high school students. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Is, it, is there a particular goal that you have in mind for how many folks you'd like to see come out this Saturday? Generally, we're looking for about 30. Okay, awesome. So that's going to be, like we said, this Saturday, September 21st from... Excuse me, from 10.30 to 12.30 p.m., not 12.30 the, uh, mid- past midnight. <laughs> <laughs> just a couple hours is all you're looking for. And can you, last question, Judy, just talk a little bit about kind of what folks might expect. Or, I mean, obviously you're just looking for people looking to pitch in, but I imagine that there's, you know, certain feelings of pride that come with maybe learning a little bit about our community's history. Maybe they might even find one of their ancestors. Who knows? <laughs> oh, that's right. That is right. So we do provide all the supplies and gloves and scrapes and things and and certain specific training Um, and we have coffee and donuts Um, but as you probably know there are some very interesting people buried there many names Mm -hmm. that'll be familiar to Cambyites like the Waite family Knight Mac is in Maxburg Baker lots and lots of names including I know one you've done some history on William Brown who was what you called the horse king of the west Uh, well I didn't Um, call him that that's what they called him but yeah yeah we did uh, it was a fascinating (laughs) story Um, and he is very there along with most of his uh, well his parents and most of his brothers and sisters Right. And I think it just, and as people look at the uh, markers and they see some of the samplings of the names and the symbols and etchings are really interesting on these old historic sure. um, sites, like the anchors and books and crowns and doves and uh, all sorts of things. And it really, I think you're right, it does instill some pride, but curiosity too. Mm. And as people walk around and realize places like this really do matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of history there, and it really is truly the, the roots of our community from those folks, many, <laughs> many, many of whom are, are buried there and in Baker Prairie as well. So that's awesome. Yes. Well, thanks so much, Judy, for your work and for telling us about it, and hopefully we'll see you'll see some folks out there. Okay, very much. Very good. Thank you, Tyler. Thanks, appreciate Judy. your help. Absolutely. Can Be Then is brought to you by Retro Revival. They are not your average antique shop. Open daily. Find them on the corner of Northwest 3rd and Grant in downtown Canby. They are the stuff of legends. Their stories weave through the fabric of a small town. Their achievements on the field court, track, and beyond stand for eternity, looming larger than life. They are sports heroes. We in Canby have had more than our fair share. In this piece, we will look back on just a few of the many worthy athletes. No discussion of Canby's hometown sports heroes would be complete without mention of Glendalyn Vineyard, truly one of the most remarkable women our small town has ever produced. Accolades came early to Glendalyn, the only daughter of local businessman and longtime Canby mayor, J.R. Vineyard, and Canby women's civic club leader, Hazel Phillips Vineyard. In 1916, at just six months, she was named prettiest baby of the Clackamas County Fair. Later, Working at Camp Onely in Malala, she was asked to take over as the new archery instructor. Sure, she said, just one little problem. She didn't know the first thing about the sport. Not that it was really a problem for Glendaline. The 1933 Camby Union High School grad was, as you'll see, a natural athlete. She found success at just about anything she set her mind to. It took all of two days to teach herself archery and in no time she was beating all her competition around the state. Archery was a big deal in those days. Newspapers covered tournaments in breathless detail. Glendalyn's chief rival in the state was an established bowsmith named Vivian Chambers, a four-time state champion in target shooting. But no one could touch Glendalyn when it came to distance. In 1938, she smashed the woman's national flight record with a 
395-yard bomb at Sherwood Field. It would become something of a habit for the strong-armed girl from Canby, as newspapers would take to calling her. Two years later, she stunned the crowds at the 61st annual National Archery Tournament in Portland with a 423-yard junket that no one, man or woman, could equal. Glendolin's arrow zoomed farther than that of any man who put his strength to the heavy bow in freestyle flight competition, said Oregonian sports writer Pat Frizzle. For the winning mark of M.B. Davis of Los Angeles in the masculine division was a mere 403 yard, 2 feet, 1 inch. She would eventually claim the world's freestyle record with an even more sensational mark of 455 yards, 8 inches. That's over four and a half football fields. She would ultimately win 56 trophies in archery, including three national championships, and for two years was the undisputed world long-distance champion for women in archery. And she was just getting started. A few years later, she decided to try her hand at bowling. She would find a talent for that, too, winning yet another championship in 1948. In 1960, she joined the Mazamas, a Portland-based mountaineering organization founded in 1894. A diagnosis of multiple sclerosis barely slowed Glendolyn down, as she earned her membership by summiting the 10,363-foot South Sister, the tallest mountain of Oregon's famed Three Sisters. She went on to participate in numerous events and in 1970 led a mountaineering outing to the Ruby Mountains of Nevada. When she wasn't sighting down a bowstring, she was usually at 91 school, where she taught third grade and PE for nearly 30 years. She attended Oregon Normal School, now Western Oregon State College, and completed her elementary education degree at Bound Angel College after marrying Ivor Neeland in October 1947. Like both parents before her, she was active in many local organizations, including the Canby Women's Civic Club, Canby United Methodist Church, Eastern Star, and Kirk Rebecca Lodge. Glendolyn Vineyard Neeland, fourth generation and longtime resident of Canby, died April 9, 1996, at the age of 80. She's buried at Zion Memorial Cemetery with her husband, Ivor, and parents. Next week, we'll be continuing our series on Canby's hometown sports heroes as we look at the legacies of Ralph and Ed Coleman, two Canby brothers. One was a professional slugger who logged almost 500 games for the Philadelphia Athletics and the St. Louis Browns in 1930s. The other was a legendary baseball coach for Oregon State University. Their field is named in his honor. That's next time on Canby Then. The great outdoors. Sometimes you just got to get away to a place where life is simpler. The air is clean and the nearest ringing phone is about a million miles away. One of the best places that we found is My Cowboy Cabin near Joseph, Oregon, in the heart of the Eagle Cap Wilderness. Eagle Cap is the largest unspoiled wilderness area in Oregon, with breathtaking views of granite mountains and crystal clear lakes, and more than 500 miles of trails to explore. It's one of the premier hiking, fishing, and hunting destinations in the Pacific Northwest. My Cowboy Cabin is open from Memorial Day weekend through Labor Day weekend, and can be reserved on a weekly or monthly basis, depending on availability. With a cabin that sleeps up to eight people... And also a teepee that sleeps eight or more... <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's perfect for family vacations, retreats, reunions, and more. Find out more at MyCowboyCabin.com. Hey, Tyler. Did you know that the world has changed in the past 20 years? No way. Yep, it's true. The way people shop for goods and services has completely changed since this thing called the Internet started catching on. Yeah, I've, I've heard of it. And yet some realtors still offer the same old services in the same old ways and for the same old percentages. Victory Point Property Group in Canby believes this time the real estate business caught up with the times. They'll meet with you for free, explain every step of the process, give you a clear game plan, and even let you choose the listing commission. Really? They 
They let you choose their commission? Really? Victory Point Property Group understands this is one of the biggest and most exciting decisions of your life, and they'll do everything they can to make sure you handle it like a rock star. Wow, that sounds great. I'm going to check them out by calling 503-263-4700 or by visiting online at victorypointhomes.com. You do that. Victory Point Property Group, real estate reimagined. The Canby Now podcast is a production of Now Hear This Studios, Canby's locally owned, full-service audio, video, and media production company. Our mission is to produce the best content in the universe, and we'd love to help you do it. Find us online at nhtstudios.com. Canby Now podcast is dedicated to preserving independent local journalism and redefining local news with our fun, fresh, and energetic brand of storytelling. Our sincere thanks to our local sponsors who make this show possible. Please show your appreciation by supporting the small businesses who support us. Huge thank you as well to our supporters on Patreon. We rely on your monthly contributions to continue to do this work that we seriously love. For information on how you can become one of the coolest people in the world, a patron of the Canby Now podcast, visit canbynowpod.com backslash plus.